So in this lecture, what I wanted to do is talk about 3D vision. I uh, talked a bit in the last two lectures about geometry, how we crush a three-dimensional world down into a uh, two-dimensional projection. I uh, want to talk a little bit about how we can use information from multiple views of the world to try and reconstruct its three-dimensional structure. Right, so one image, we crush 3D down into 2D, but if we've got two two-dimensional images of the same scene, I take a picture of the, of the room from here and a picture of the room from here, then suddenly I've got a whole lot more a whole lot more information and in theory I can reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of the room. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and talk about how 3D TVs work and, and, and so on. So I go back to this sort of ambiguity of scale and I used this picture in an earlier lecture. Right? It's at face value, first time you look at it it's a bit surprising because thing, the, the size, the scale is not quite right. The three-dimensional world is playing a trick on us and you know, clearly it's because the the small lady is further away from us, that she appears to be smaller. So here's a, uh, a picture I took of, of a stone, yeah? of a red stone. So anyone know how big that stone is? Actually smaller. But really you've got nothing to, you've got nothing to judge it by. Yeah? And so, okay, so there's a red stone and it's about that big. There's another red stone, uh, right? They're the same size. Uh, so what's going on here? There's something about, it's the distance is, is, is what's important. That one on the top is a massive stone that's a very long way away and it appears the same size as a very small stone, which I meant to bring it today. Uh, it's my one prop for the lecture. Uh, and you know, because it's a small stone close up, uh, it appears to be the same size. It subtends the same angle, if you like, at our eye or at the, at the camera. It's the same number of pixels wide. So again, from an earlier slide, I used, I used this image where we're projecting an image from the outside world using a pinhole camera onto a wall. And all of those uh, shapes from outside cause exactly the same image on the wall. Right? So there is, I think of this as saying there's no unique inverse. I can take a three-dimensional scene and I can construct what the photograph would look like. But given the photograph, I can't construct what the 3D world looks like. There's something missing. The depth is missing. Right? We lost the dimension when we made a photograph. We can't just get it back. So we need to use some sorts of assumptions in order to get, get that back. So have a look at this little movie. Uh, lift it off YouTube. Anyone been in a room like this? I think this is one in New Zealand, actually. Uh, there's quite a bit of footage on, uh, on YouTube for it. Yeah. This is a... So, it's a cheap trick. This is a picture again, two people uh, in the room and yeah, they appear to be quite different, different sizes. If they swap around, uh, then you know, that's, that's been reversed. So this thing's called an Ames room. Uh, it's a bit of an, an illusion. Uh, so you look into the Ames room through a hole that's in the wall on the, on the bottom of the diagram that's on the right hand side there. And all the lines on the floor have been constructed to, uh, based on the fact that you're looking in it, through, looking at the room through that one, one hole. You look at it from a different point of view and the tiles on the floor would not look square and the illusion would be broken. And so when the person goes to the left-hand side of the, of, the, of the room and appears to be much smaller, right, that's because they are actually further away. And you would expect them, if they're further away, that they would look smaller but the geometry of the room has been constructed so that you think they are the same distance away. There's the same number of floor tiles right, between the observer and the person who's far away or the person who's clear, who's close, because the floor tiles are actually not square. Right? So that's how the trick works. So you, in your eyes, you, you see, sort of you're counting the number of tiles. You think it's the same, but, but it's not. So human beings use an awful lot of different ways to try and figure out how far away things are. And uh, it's not just the fact you've got two eyes and you look at the world from different viewpoints. Uh, there's a paper, quite an interesting paper, that says there's maybe nine different ways that we use unconsciously to work out 
how far things are away from us. And these different, uh, different techniques, they're often called different visual cues, uh, depend on the distance. So there's a graph at the side which says the, the distance range over which these different effects work. And I'll go through and illustrate these, these, different, these different effects. There are some techniques you use for things that are close, some th that you use for things that are very far away. So the very simplest thing, the way of working out how far away things are, is called occlusion. It's relative ordering. So here, what's closer to you, the tiger or the tree? Right, because it obscures the tiger. And so we use this simple ordering uh, that you know, I can see in the audience who's further away because they're obscured by people who are closer. So very, very simple, but in our brain, that's one of the factors we're using to build up a three-dimensional model of the world. The next one is height in the visual field and relative size. So we tend to think that if things are big, they're closer, and if they're small, they're further away. And we also know something about the relative size. We know, you know that an elephant is big and a person is small. So we, make some, we compensate for, for that in some way. So we've seen an elephant and a person. We expect the elephant to be bigger than the person. If the elephant's the same size as the person, then we're probably going to infer that the elephant is further away. Yeah? So the Ames rule messes with this because it, it, it messes with our sense of relative size. We expect that these two people are going to be roughly the same height and they're not. And so then we perceive that in terms of distance, but there are other cues about distance that are contradicting the cues. So these two effects that normally work quite well for us are, are subverted in something like the Ames room. So another one's texture density. So if I, I look at this gravel path, and close to me the gravel's quite coarse, right? The, the individual stones are quite large, but as we go further away the stones appear to be smaller. So if we think of it in terms of a texture, up close it's a very coarse texture and further away it's a much finer texture. So we unconsciously evaluate the texture of things. We assume that the texture of the material is constant, but the change in the apparent texture tells us something about distance from us. Aerial perspective is this kind of effect. As things get further away from us, they tend to get fuzzier and they also tend to change colour a little bit. They tend to become a little bit more blue. So this is something that works over very large distances. It works over you know, tens, many, many tens of kilometres rather than something within your, your sort of personal sphere. Another one's called binocular disparity and I'm going to talk quite a bit about this in, in the rest of the lecture. It's the fact that we view the world from two slightly different viewpoints, from our two eyes. And from that, we can actually get some quite powerful information about its three-dimensional structure. Another one is accommodation. And accommodation is feedback that we get from the muscles in our eyes. So when we focus our eyes and see this little animation, there are muscles that are squeezing the lens in our eye. So when we're trying to focus on something that's up close, and we have to distort the shape of our lens in order to bring it into focus. And if you try and bring something in quite close to your eye, it's almost painful, right? Your eye is struggling to try and focus. Uh, so there are these muscles that work the eye. Sadly, as you get older, they don't work as well. Uh, it means that uh, that the mus that needs to be squeezed in order to focus close. As you get older, it doesn't squeeze as well. You can't focus, can't focus as close. And it gets to a point where you start holding things further and further away from your eyes. And when your arms are no longer long enough, you go and get spectacles. Uh, for most, hum most people, this occurs in their 40s. Uh, it's going to happen to all of you. All right, so that's accommodation. It's feedback from the muscles in your eye that tell you something about how far away, how far away it is. Another one's convergence. And when you are focusing on something close, right, your eyes point in. And something that's further away, your eyes are pointing out. So when you're focusing on something, not only your, your individual eyes adjusting their focus on the object, the angles that your, that your eyes are gazing in gives you some indication of how far away things are. So really high performance muscles in your eyes, and you get feedback from those into your brain. So that's yet another cue on, on distance. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit now about binocular disparity. How do we use information from two images uh, to, to figure out how far away things are? So here are two pictures of the same scene uh, taken from a slightly different viewpoint. So this is a sort of, you, you, 
in, you used to be able to get uh, stereo viewers. You buy these little stereo photographs, you put them in, you look at them through the eyepieces, and you, you get a, a vivid three dimensional perception. What's that? Some people can cross their eyes and see the three dimensional effect. Uh, I'm, I'm rubbish at, at doing that. I've only done it once or twice, being able to do this by, by crossing my eyes. So the pictures are almost the same, but there are some very, very subtle differences. And I'll just point some of them some out to you. So if we look Finally, at we come to divergences. Here we have convergence right. with both eyes In adducted right picture, and divergence where both eyes abduct back to the left. primary position. And you sort of expect that. So if I'm, if I'm looking at, at, at you lot, and if I move my head to the right, everything in the room appears to move to the left. Yeah, so that's a general phenomenon. As you move your viewpoint uh, in one direction, the world appears to move in the opposite direction. Yeah? So that's what they've exploited here. They've shifted everything a little bit to the side uh, from one image to the other. So in the right-hand image, everything's moved a little bit to the left. So I've drawn an arrow here of a constant length. And we see in the, in the left-hand picture, it's, it's the length is a distance from the edge to the, to the lamppost. Uh, you can see in the other image that the distance of the lamppost from the edge is actually, actually somewhat reduced. This is a slightly busier one. There are actually two pictures of a pile of rocks here. Uh, there's not, no very obvious dividing line here. And what I've done is I have uh, drawn an arrow to a little spot, a blemish, on one of those rocks. And that's the yellow, the yellow arrow that you see in the left. And what I've done is I've drawn the same length arrow in the other image. And what can you say about the spot that's on the rock? Yeah, it's moved over to the left. Now I'm going to pick another, another feature in this scene. I am going to, and so that bluey pink arrow points, points back. That's the difference uh, in the position of that blemish from one image to the other. So here is uh, an arrow that points from the left-hand edge of the image to the edge of a rock. There's the same arrow on the other image, and there's the, there's the, uh, the distance back. So the shift right, from that, the, that the point undergoes between the left image and the right image, yes, it's moved to the left, but it's not constant. You see the one at the bottom, it's shifted to the left quite a lot. The one at the top is shifted to the left less. You see that? And that's because it's further away. So if I move a little bit to move my head a bit to the right, you're going to move a lot in my field of view because you're close to me. But the person at the back of the room moves proportionally less. If there's something that's an infinite distance away, it's not going to move at all. So if I go out at night and I move my head, the stars don't move at all. Right? But something that's close to me is going to move a lot. So what we see is this shift. The distance by which something shifts when you move the camera is in, actually inversely proportional to how far away it is. Things that are close move a lot. Things that are far away move, move very little. And this is the basis of, of stereo photography, of stereo vision. So here is a blast from the past, something uh, from Kodak, uh, now defunct, that took two pictures on film from two slightly different viewpoints. And the separation of the, uh, of the two lenses mimics roughly the separation of the eyes. And uh, we have B, which is called the baseline. That's the distance between the two cameras. We know the focal length of the lens. We talked a bit about focal length before. So the distance, uh, sorry, the, the shift, which we call disparity, that's for me, is, that's the symbol D there, is proportional to the focal length and the baseline and inversely proportional to distance. So if I can measure the disparity, if I can measure the shift of something between the left image and the right image, and I know the focal length and I know the baseline, then I can work out how far away it is. So that's from the film camera days. This is a fairly typical stereo camera that we might put on a robot today in order to try and figure out the three-dimensional structure of the world through which the robot is moving. Now, when I look at the world, I've got my two eyes, and they're clearly at different points. Right? So I'm getting you know, a view from here, and I'm getting a view from here, and my brain is putting all this together and helping me to figure out how far away things are. If I take just two images, like an image that's taken from a camera here and an image that's taken from a camera here, in order for me to see the 3D, three dimensionality of the scene, I need to get the image from this camera into this eye and the image from that camera into this eye. 
right? And if I can replicate that, then I'm going, my brain is going to perceive the three-dimensional structure of the world. So we go back to this little postcard example before, and there's me. Right, so we have two images, a left image and a right image, and I need to put them into the right eyes. I need to put the left image into the left eye, right image into the, into the right eye. If you cross them over, you get a really bizarre depth effect. It, 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 your brain just can't compute it, and you don't see, you don't have any feel of, of depth perception at all. So how do I do that? Well, if it was an old uh, stereo, a stereo viewer, it's something like this, and you put the little postcard in the slot in the top, and you look through the two eyepieces, and you get this quite vivid uh, perception of, of, of distance. So I've got a couple of props here. I'll get someone to pass this around. Can someone come and grab, take, this, take this off me? There we go. So. Here's an example of, of one that I bought on a trip somewhere. This is from, from Prague. So you look through that and you get actually quite a nice, nice three-dimensional uh, view, view of the bridge. You see that? Good. Uh, so sorry, that's, 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 this slide. that's this slide here. And Prague's important because that's where this guy called Karl Kapek lived and he's the guy who coined the term robot. Uh, so he came from Prague. It seemed sort of highly apt when I was there. So there are other ways of doing this. This is uh, something like this. It's kind of primitive. You can use uh, a head-mounted display. So that's something you can clip onto your head, and it's got two little uh, LCD screens in it. Uh, one projects into the left eye, and one projects into the right eye. And that will give you very, very vivid uh, three-dimensional uh, view of the world. But the, the image that goes into the left eye and the right eye have to come from two cameras that are somewhere else in the world and are projected back into the relative pardon me, into, into the relevant eyes. There's another way of doing it, uh, another quite cheap trick. And what I do is I color code the two images. I code one image, I color it red. Another image, I color it blue. And I use a pair of cheap and nasty blue and red glasses, which puts what the, uh, the, during the left image, which comes through the red filter and comes into this eye only. The blue image comes through the blue filter and comes into this eye put the glasses on upside down, you're putting the images into the wrong eyes and the 3D effect will collapse. So uh, this, been, this effect has been known for quite a long time. Uh, people have dabbled with 3D movies from probably the earliest days of, of movies. Uh, people have been fascinated by 3D. The technology has improved in, in recent times, so you probably, the uh, last one I saw was Prometheus in 3D. It was, plot line wasn't much good, but the 3D was OK. Uh, Avatar bef before that. So what I have here is a, an anaglyph image. Would you like to come forward again? <laughs> All right, got some glasses. If you could just uh, sprinkle them around the room. Lucky there's not many people here. Um, and there's a, really, there's a really posh pair. You can have a really posh pair. <laughs> And I want these back. But, yeah, get up and walk around if you want. I've, I've got about three or four anaglyph images here. They're kind of they're kind of cool. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. Try putting the glasses on upside down, and you see. <laughs> this is this is worth a, this is worth a picture. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. If if you haven't got any, uh, share 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 them around. If you comfortable with that, I'll move on to the next one. So what happens? You look at it upside down. You get no effect at all. Or does it make you want to throw up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here's one from the, uh, the last series of Mars rovers. Uh, NASA put a lot of images from the rovers up on the web in this format. Uh, so for the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that went up five years ago or something like that, this is a picture of the, uh, the, the uh, deflated airbags after it landed. Uh, as it you know, came off the platform, looked back and uh, it saw that. Uh, No, it's got, uh, it's got stereo cameras on there, and there are these images, they're called anaglyph images. There are already some anaglyph images up there. 
Uh, so go to the go to the website and, and have a look. Uh, this one's quite this one's quite striking. This one's got quite good uh, quite good perception uh, depth perception. And if you look at the image without the glasses on, you can sort of you can see the the overlap between the, the red and the blue, and you can see the changes as a function of distance. Uh, this one the uh, the shift is actually getting more with distance, but that's just because of the, the way this particular uh, image has been taken. So, everyone had enough fun with red and blue glasses? Very good. This is the best lecture of the year. Uh, another way you can do it, and a, a more sophisticated way of doing it, is with shutter glasses. So, if any of you got a, anyone got a 3D TV? Yeah. Seen a 3D TV? Yeah, and you got the, you got the glasses? Yeah. yeah. yeah? That's right. So what they're doing is the TV is showing the left image, and then your shutter glasses have got two, L two LCDs, uh, which can be either opaque or clear. And so when the TV is displaying a left image, this one is open and this one's black, and then it flips over and does it like this. So the images are being displayed at probably 50 hertz or 100 hertz, left, right, left, right, left, right, and the glasses are in synchronization. Right, so that they open and shut at the right time. So generally there's an infrared transmitter on the telly which is sending a signal to the glasses to, um, to do the right thing. If it wasn't synchronized, the, the effect would be lost. Uh, so that's what, you can, that's what you can see there. So the problem with all of these display technologies, you've got to wear something on your head. Right, it's very unnatural. You've got to wear these cheap glasses, you've got to wear shutter glasses, you've got to look into a gadget or put a gadget on your head. Uh, and people have been struggling for a long time to figure out ways that you can, you can do this. And there are a few technologies starting to come out now that go some of the way here. This is one that's somewhat recent and it's a bit of a busy diagram. But basically there's an LCD dis uh, panel at the front which is displaying the picture. And behind that then is a uh, an arrangement of prisms. So you illuminate the, uh, the light on one side and then the light comes through the, uh, off those prisms and through the LCD screen in a direction that hits mostly your left eye. Then you change to the other light and the rays come out at a different angle and mostly hit your, your right eye. So you have to move your head backwards and forwards to get into the zone. But once you're there, then you get this really strong 3D perception without having to wear anything on your head. Yeah, so have you you've seen these? Okay. What's that? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, this is a technology that potentially could come to to phones one day, one day soon, which would be pretty pretty exciting. What's really what's really nice about this is it's actually quite compact. I mean, it's the existing LCD display. And instead of the backlight that you have, it's just a slightly more complicated backlight. Uh, so yeah, I can imagine that this, this could well be in the phones in the, in the next few years. So that's how you can take two images uh, from cameras, you know, a little distance apart. And typically the cameras need to be about the same distance apart as your eyes. Otherwise you get the, the, the depth scale becomes all wrong. Present them back to the two eyes and we get a sense of three dimensionality. But what would a robot do? So for a robot, what it's going to do is it's going to take images from two different cameras and it's going to do some computation on them to try and work out the 3D structure to build a three-dimensional model of the world. And so I'm going to give this little example here. And it'd be easier if I could wander over and point, but I can't. Uh, so what I've done is I've taken two pictures of the Eiffel Tower from... So I took a picture and I walked over there and I took another picture. And the amount that... Something shifts in the image, depends on how far away it is from me. So in computational stereo, what we do is I take a little template in the left-hand image. So I've just chopped out the top of the Eiffel Tower, yeah? I've made a little template. And in the second image, what I do is I search for that template at a number of different horizontal locations. And I find the location at which it's got the best fit. So this is a simple image matching technique. So for the pixel, in the middle of the top of the tower, I take out the surrounding pixels, I call it a template, and I look for that template in a horizontal direction. And when I find it, I say, that's the horizontal shift at that particular pixel. Uh, so I can compute the disparity of every pixel. So generally what I do is I do it for a range of disparities. There's, it, 
It can't shift the other way. It's not possible. If I, if I move to the right, everything in the image has to move to the left. So there's no way I have to look to the right in the other image. It's not possible for that template to be over there. So that reduces the amount of compute, computation that I need to do. And I can also know something about the maximum distance that I need to search. And that depends on really how close things are to me. So that's a very simple computational approach. An awful lot of computation, but the technique is at itself very, very simple-minded. So if I take uh, pictures of, two pictures of this rock pile with something like this robot stereo camera, uh, I can beat on it and I can produce an image that looks like this. It's shown in grayscale, but this is what we call a depth image. So here, the brightness is related to depth. So things that are brighter close to me and things that are far away are darker. Yeah? So this is an image where the pixel is not the value of the pixel, not the color of the pixel, it's how far away it is from me, uh, which is really powerful. So these images look kind of ghostly because the, the original color's gone, the texture's gone. All we have is the distance away of each pixel in the scene. So in the, uh, the MATLAB toolbox that you guys have been using, there's a function called iStereo. You give it a left image and a right image, uh, and it will produce a depth map just like this. Uh, once I've got that, I can do a 3D reconstruction, which looks pretty crappy here. Uh, but in this, if you're actually rotating it around in MATLAB, you can, it looks much more three-dimensional than it does sort of static there. But it's a, a rough three-dimensional rendering of the structure of those piles of rocks. So if I have these two images, the left image and the right image, then again in the toolbox there's a function that turns them into an anaglyph. Yep, whack on the glasses. Uh, <laughs> All right. So this is a really powerful technique for a robot. Cameras are pretty cheap, so I can just take two pictures, do a whole bunch of image processing, and in a small fraction of a second, I've got the three-dimensional structure of the world. And three-dimensional structure is really powerful. I can tell me how far away an object is, and if I'm a robot, that's going to tell me whether I'm going to collide with it in the next tenth of a second or the next ten seconds. Uh, from its three-dimensional structure, I can perhaps figure out what type of object it is, and I can use that to uh, plan the path or plan the task of my robot. Now, another thing I want to talk a little bit about is what you can do if I just take two pictures of the same scene. So what we have in the top, top there uh, is a picture taken of the Eiffel Tower by my daughter Lucy. And down the bottom, there is a picture that I took of Lucy taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower. Right? So that's Lucy in the, in the foreground. She's holding her camera up like, up like this. Right? So we took the pictures at almost exactly the same time. It's probably got a professor as a father, I guess. Uh, so we took two pictures at the same time. Now, it's often really important when you're trying to process images that are taken of the same scene but taken from, from different cameras to try and figure out, okay, I want to know where's a particular point in the world. How do I find that point in my two images? Right, so I want to find where's the top of the Eiffel Tower in this image, where's the top of the Eiffel Tower in this image? What are their pixel coordinates in those two images? Because once I know that, then I know all the geometry of image formation and I can do some, do some cool stuff. So there is a, a whole technique of what are called feature detectors. And so what's overlaid on this image here, each circle represents what we call a feature in the image. That's something that's kind of distinctive, a very a pattern of pixels that's quite unique. And then I've got a good chance of finding in any other picture that I took of the Eiffel Tower. So the center of the circle represents the feature. And the size of the circle says something about how big the feature is. So you can see that uh, on the ground there tends to be some small features. So this is a pattern of pixels that's quite tight. But it's also seen some things that are very big, like one feature might be an Eiffel Tower. You know, so it describes that whole Eiffel Tower as a feature, but it might also see a dead leaf on the ground as a feature. So each feature has got a position. Uh, it's got a description uh, that enables me to compare it with with features from other images, and it's also got a, some sort of scale or size. Now, once I've got these features for one image and for another image, then what I can do is then I can look for what's called correspondence. So here what I've done is that my picture and Lucy's picture, so these are pictures taken with two cameras, two quite different cameras, different focal length, different numbers of megapixels, and those green lines join points 
that are the same point in the world but found in two different images. So you see what's going on here? Each pixel represents, the pixel at each end of the green line represents the same thing in the world, right? but, from a, but from a different location. And once I've got that, that's gold, that information is gold, I can do some cool tricks. So one is, there's the picture of, uh, that I took up in the top, uh, sorry, that's the picture Lucy took up in the top. Here's my picture of Lucy taking the picture, and all those lines converge on the point where her camera is. So just from two images and this trick, I can work out where is the camera that took that picture. So this is my picture and I can work out where that other picture was taken from, just with some simple geometry, which is pretty powerful. This technique of finding the same point in the world in multiple pictures is what's used when you stitch together panoramas. So you take a bunch of overlapping pictures, you find some points that belong in this picture and this picture, you find enough of them, and then you stretch and shift the images until they overlap exactly. And that's how, that's how you build panoramas. Uh, here's an example of what's called image stitching or image mosaicing. And here I've got maybe half a dozen pictures, aerial photos, and I've overlaid them one on top of the other by finding points that are the same in multiple pictures, shifting the pictures around until they line up very nicely. And you can see that uh, the images are quite nicely registered. We're making a panorama. <laughs> so these are, and I'm not going to go into details of how we do this feature extraction and how we do the matching. I just want you just to sort of to get the, the general concept. And really the last couple of slides I'm going to run are some pretty cool work that people have done on very, very large scale uh, reconstruction. So I'm just going to run these, these two videos and we can talk a little bit about them. I'll try to rack the volume up. You can think about what Photosynth does as linking images together. Whenever images are taken in a common environment, <laughs> it's as if you form a hyperlink between them. And, and so now if you think about the emergent network of hyperlinks between images that, that, can, that can be built by a crawler, say, uh, going out and searching the whole, uh, the whole web, it's a very powerful idea. Here's a shot of St. Peter's Basilica. We're looking at it where we can navigate through hundreds of photos. The fun thing happens when we arrange all these guys into a common three-dimensional environment. Here's a point cloud, a model that's going to be constructed from all of those images. So these are just pictures that's that they got from Flickr. Long, so we can see where they all ended up. <laughs> you see this kind of complicated picture of lots of photos in their own planes inside that model. Let's go dive in and find the photo we're looking at. And now we can move back and forth among different photos, like this, just moving from side to side. These white boxes that are now appearing on the screen are showing where photos were taken. So, for example, if you want to close up over here, you click on that, and you see that everything is registered perfectly with the three-dimensional model. So you can imagine a technology like this one with many people's photos being registered simultaneously becoming like the three-dimensional map or a universe. We have a three-dimensional reconstruction of the environment. And we can also, of course, look at those photos individually. And then from there, we can navigate around the space, either via photos or via the entire environment. This is all of them turned on simultaneously, which is kind of fun. If we want to look at other images similar to the one we're looking at right now, we can do this trick. Now we've moved close to the center of the screen all of the images that share a lot of context with that image that we were just looking at before. These are nearly identical shots. Here's, for example, a close-up of this clock. Looking at similar shots, we see that the clock also occurred in a number of other photos, like this one. So this gives you a way of grouping and navigating between images using the image contents without any kind of tagging having taken place beforehand, no hand intervention. This shows you how I can zoom on different parts of the image. And uh, as we zoom, only the necessary data for that particular part is, is coming in over the network. This is all of the images that had this same content anywhere in them. So here's another image of the same museum, another image. And you can see the registration happen in real time as we go back and forth between those images. Here we're moving back and forth among neighboring images, so images that share some content. So this gives you a kind of neighbor tour, gives you a rapid way of navigating around inside that space. If you had an image like this one somewhere on the web, and you wanted to know what's in one of those murals, another photo would just be discoverable like that. This photo could have come from somewhere else entirely. 
it certainly gives you a way of looking at other perspectives on something or close-ups or what's around the corner based on a starting image. Let's see that this close-up is on a web page that talks about this particular scene. You can dive in and then dive back out at that web page. And so it gives you a way of looking contextually across different places on the web where the image content actually lives. This long-standing dream of augmented reality where the computer will tell you about the world, the real world that you're immersed in, will finally be delivered with this kind of photosynth technology. We're going to see a collision of the real world and the virtual world that will create this incredible experience that people can go and visit and really get a sense of what it's like to see things they've never seen before. So you had a general idea of what they're doing there? They're just mining photographs off the, off the internet. Uh, and just by the content, the, what's the detail that's in those images, they can group them without any kind of tagging. They can work out where the photographs were taken from and basically reconstruct the views from lots and lots of different photographs. Uh, it's a pretty awesome way of, of, of navigating. The last one, uh, a, similar, a similar idea. Who says Rome wasn't built in a day? Muscle of about 500 computers and 150,000 still images, Steve Seitz and his colleagues at the University of Washington Seattle campus reconstructed many of Rome's famous landmarks in just 21 hours. The idea behind Rome today is that we wanted to see how big of a city or model we can build from photos on the internet. With support from the National Science Foundation, they're rebuilding Rome pixel by pixel instead of brick by brick. Calculations that once took months now take hours. This is the largest 3D reconstruction that anyone has ever tried. It's completely organic. It works just from any image that we upload to photos and they suddenly appear in our models. It starts with a trip to the photo sharing site Flickr to search for images of the real thing. Once pictures are identified, the computer starts the process of making 3D objects from 2D stills. If I'm a sculptor, there are three photographs of me. We find the three points in, in those three photographs which point to my nose. From that, we know that there are three points in these three images which correspond to a single point in the 3D world. Computers map huge clusters of these points into 3D space, creating ghost-like images called point clouds. Those squares represent the positions of the source photos. For buildings, I think we can get accuracy to within um, you know, a few centimeters. We've measured this. And for individual objects that are photographed closer up, we could potentially do a lot better, like you know, millimeter level accuracy. Finally, color and texture are added. What you get is a virtual 3D tour, like this fly-through of Dubrovnik, Croatia. What excites me is the ability to capture the real world, to, to be able to reconstruct the experience of being somewhere without actually being there. Look for this next generation technology to show up in online mapping sites, video games, and a whole lot more. It's a virtual guarantee. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. So this is one of the many things Google's doing with uh, Street View cars. I mean, not just being, a, not more than just allowing you to click on a map and see what the view looks like from the road, but actually now creating whole 3D models uh, of the buildings that are there. Uh, so we have the technology to do this now. Uh, the, the, the mathematical techniques are, are quite complicated. It's enormously expensive in terms of computing power. But companies like Google have just got so much computing power available to them that it makes this, makes this very, very feasible. So just uh, you know, some of the cool things you can do with images and geometry. We can go from, uh, we know how to project the three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional scene. From lots of two-dimensional scenes, we can recreate the three-dimensional world. So we can go backwards, we can go backwards and forwards. So quick, quick uh, summary of what we of what we covered. Uh, we uh, we use a number of uh, techniques to figure out how far away things are from us, from simple measures like occlusion to uh, aerial perspective, uh, the muscles in our eyes, the directions that our eyes are pointing. We use this technique of uh, binocular or stereo vision. You can think about what Photosynth does as linking images together. Whenever images are taken in a common... Uh, we 
can uh, present uh, pairs of images to our eyes. And as long as we get the right image to the correct eye, uh, we get a very, we get a very, very vivid sense of depth. Uh, and if we can find, in who says Rome images, wasn't built in a day? Then we can do this three Muscle of about 500 computers and 150,000 still images. Steve Seitz and his colleagues at the University of Washington's Seattle campus reconstructed many of Rome's famous landmarks in just 21 hours. That's some the idea behind Rome in a day is that right we wanted now. to see how big of a city... Uh, I've got a slide here of a few announcements. Some of them I mentioned at the beginning. Field trips next Thursday, bus leaves 12.10 uh, p.m. sharp, William Street. So across the uh, other side of Alice Street.